Welcome to Stories from Palestine podcast, a podcast recorded in Palestine and about Palestine. My name is Crystal. I studied history and tour guiding, and I live in Palestine with my Palestinian husband and children. I started this podcast during the COVID pandemic in the summer of 2020. And now that tourism is slowly coming back to Palestine, I will continue the podcast bi-weekly. So subscribe on your podcast player and turn on the notifications if you want to be reminded of new episodes. You can also follow Stories from Palestine on Facebook and Instagram, where I will share a virtual soundbite of each new episode. If you have listened to the previous two episodes, then you have heard that I have decided to go for the tour guide program that will give me access to an exam that will, if I pass it, license me to be a tour guide in all of historic Palestine and Jerusalem. Until I get that license, I am not allowed to be a tour guide. And there are several historic sites where they actually do check if the tour guide has the license. One of these places is the Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem. And because I cannot take anybody inside the church and explain, I decided to make an audio tour. You can listen to this audio tour at home and you can Google some images or look at the social media of Stories from Palestine podcast or the website to find some of the photos and images that I collected. You can also, when you visit, use this audio tour while you are visiting the church and listen to my voice when you are in the church. Because the introduction to the history of this church and the audio tour together were over an hour of recording, I decided to chop them into two halves. So in this episode, you can hear more about the background, the history of the church. And in the next episode, you can take the audio tour inside the church. The Holy Sepulchre Church is probably one of the most visited sites in the old city of Jerusalem. Now, what does it mean, the Holy Sepulchre Church? What is a sepulchre? A sepulchre is a small place cut out in rock, or it can be also referred to when it's a monument built of stone. But it's a place in which a dead person is laid or buried. The famous Holy Sepulchre Church in Jerusalem is said to have been built on the site where Jesus was buried after his crucifixion. And Christians believe that after three days he rose again and he was alive and he was among the people for about 40 days. And after that he ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives, and you can hear all about that in the episode I recorded in March 2022 about the Mount of Olives. I want to take you for a tour inside the Holy Sepulchre Church, and you may even use it as an audio tour when you visit the church. Until I am a licensed tour guide, I cannot take people officially inside the church, but you can use this episode in order to understand and listen to my voice when you visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But before taking you inside, let's understand the location of this church that is now in the middle of the old city of Jerusalem. Because if we read the Bible, then it mentions that Jesus was crucified outside the city walls on a hill called Golgotha in Aramaic and Calvary in Latin. But both words, Golgotha and Calvary, mean skull or a bald head. And this probably refers to the shape of the rock on which the crosses were placed for the crucifixion. And the location where the church is built is now not anymore outside of the city walls. It is now right in the middle of the city. But that is because in later times... The city expanded and the location of the wall has changed. So the area was outside of the city wall 2,000 years ago, but is now inside the new city walls. And it was, in the time of Jesus, a stone quarry. 
a place from where stones were cut to build the houses and the buildings inside the city walls. And it is very likely that the crucifixion took place on a cliff that was overlooking this stone quarry, so that the crosses were up high, right next to a large, deep hole in the ground from where the stones had been quarried. On the other side of that stone quarry, where the rocks became higher again, some tombs were cut out in the rocks, and these were used for burial outside of the city, because dead people were never buried in the city. And according to the Bible, Jesus' body was taken down from the cross by a Jewish man, a Pharisee. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish court. His name was Nicodemus. And then Jesus' body was buried in a new grave, a new tomb that belonged to a man called Joseph of Arimathea, who was a rich Jew who cared a lot about Jesus' teachings. So I hope that you can picture this in your imagination. There's a stone quarry, a place where stones were dug out in large quantities to build the houses in the city, so that at that place a deep pit was created. And a cliff that looked like a skull was just next to the stone quarry, and that is where the crucifixions took place. And on the other side we have some rock-cut tombs. That is the scene 2,000 years ago. Now, the Holy Sepulchre Church that we can visit today covers all of this scene. And that explains that when you get inside the church, directly to your right, there is a flight of stairs that goes up to the top of the cliff where the crucifixion took place. And if you go left into the church, you will end up seeing some rock-cut tombs inside the chapels, on the western side of the church. And if you get into the church and you take right, after about 50 meters, you will go down the first and second pair of stairs and you will find yourself deep down in a part of the ancient stone quarry where you can still see the chisels in the rocks. And this is the place where, according to tradition, the cross of Jesus was found by Queen Helena, who then, with her son Constantine, built the first church in Jerusalem. More about the interior in the next episode. But are we sure that this is the exact place where the crucifixion happened? Because there is another location that is indicated as the possible location for the Golgotha, or the Calvary the place of the crucifixion, and that place was not venerated until the 19th century. It's a very late tradition. This location was appointed by mainly British and American Protestants, and that place can now be visited, not inside the old city, but outside the old city walls, at a place called the Garden Tomb. You can access it from the Nablus Road, which is close to the Jerusalem Hotel. And there are a number of reasons why that site seems less obvious, but it's definitely a nice place to visit. It also has some rock-cut tombs, but they date back to the 8th and 7th century before Christ, so not to the time of the Romans 2,000 years ago when Jesus was crucified, But it is a nice place, there's a lovely garden, and the people there will give you a beautiful tour and explain you more about why they do think this may be the location of the crucifixion. But the longest tradition in veneration of the place of Jesus' death and burial is where the Holy Sepulchre Church stands today. And what we know for sure is that the city of Jerusalem in Jesus' time was completely destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD. And it is written that no stone was left on the other. It was completely ransacked and completely destroyed by the Roman soldiers. And it lasted until around 135 AD when Roman Emperor Hadrian decided to establish a whole new city that the city was first rebuilt. 
He didn't call Jerusalem Jerusalem. He called it Alia Capitolina after his own family name, Alia. And then Capitolina meant that the new city was dedicated to Jupiter Capitolinus, to whom also a temple was built on the Temple Mount. And he had some other new temples erected in that time, all of them for Roman gods. And it seems that it was not a coincidence that he decided to build a pagan temple on the site of Jesus' crucifixion, because he saw that the followers of Jesus, the followers of this new religion, were growing, and he wanted to wipe out the place where the memory of Jesus was still venerated. So what did he do? He filled up the quarry, the stone quarry, with sand and stones, and he erected a temple on top of that very location. Now, about 200 years later, when the Roman Emperor Constantine was in power and his mother Helena converted to Christianity, they came to travel around the Holy Land and especially Queen Helena was searching for evidence of the places where Jesus had been, according to the biblical stories and the traditions. And it is said that when she came to this area in Jerusalem, she found three crosses that were thrown in a deep pit in part of that old stone quarry. And then they brought a woman from the city who was very sick. She was nearly deaf. And they had her touch these three crosses. And then the first and the second cross that she touched didn't have any effect on her. But then when she touched the third cross, she was immediately miraculously healed and that's how Helena knew that this is the true cross which meant that the other two crosses were of the criminals that had been crucified on either side of Jesus which is part of the Bible story. Now Constantine and Helena decided that they wanted to remove the pagan temple that Hadrian built and they had all the soil removed, all the sand and the rubble that Hadrian had used to fill in that stone quarry, they were also removed. And they went down to the lowest layer of the stone quarry and that's when they found the rock-cut tomb that they identified as the tomb of Jesus. And all of this happened in the year 326, And then the first church was built on this location. Now, Queen Helena and Constantine wanted visitors of the church to be able to walk around the tomb of Jesus. But the tomb of Jesus was cut into the bedrock. So what they did was they cut that tomb loose from the rest of of the bedrock. It's a bit hard to explain, but you have to imagine that they removed a lot of stone, a lot of bedrock, in order for people to be able to circambulate around the tomb of Jesus. And that must have been a hell of a job. So imagine, they just cut away all the rock around the tomb, and then they build a beautiful embellished shrine over the remaining tomb. And this little house, this shrine, is called an edicule. And today when you visit the church, you will still see an edicule, but it is not the original one from the 4th century, because the church has been completely, almost completely destroyed twice, but this new edicule that you see today is on the same spot as where the original edicule was built by Constantine and his mother. Actually, recently they did excavations inside the church and the archaeologists and researchers found rock layers of the stone quarry on which the first Constantinian church was built. So they went down to the bedrock and they found the first layer of the church. So the first church was destroyed by the invading Persians. This was in 614. It is the year in which many churches and monasteries have been destroyed in the Holy Land. And 
a lot of monks and nuns were killed in that year. And then a new church was built in the Byzantine time. And that second church was also almost completely destroyed in the year 1009 by the mad Caliph al-Hakim. He ruled during the Fatimid period in Egypt and he also gave order to destroy a lot of churches in the Holy Land. And I want to add that the relationship with the Muslims before that, before Hakim came, had not been bad because when Jerusalem first came under the Muslim rule in 638, the Caliph Oman ibn al-Khattab visited the church and he wrote a decree in which he stated that the church should not be used by Muslims for prayer and that the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, should be protected in the city. And there is that famous legend that says that he, even though he was invited by the Archbishop Sophronius to pray inside the church, he refused to do so because he was afraid that Muslims then later would claim the church. So he picked up a stone, he threw it far away, and where the stone hit the ground, he prayed. And then in later times, on that location, a mosque with the name of the Omar Mosque, named after him, was built. And until today, you will see right across from the Holy Sepulchre Church, the Omar Mosque. It's still in use. And a similar legend, a similar story goes around in Bethlehem, where also right across from the Nativity Church, we see a mosque called the Omar Mosque. But back to the Holy Sepulchre Church. After the destruction by the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim, the church was rebuilt again for the third time. And then when the Crusaders arrived in the year 1099, they also did a lot of renovations and they rebuilt parts of the church in the beautiful Romanesque style. They also did some additions. For example, the bell tower was built in that time. And of the bell tower, we see only part of it remaining after some of the infamous earthquakes. So much of what you see today of the Holy Sepulchre Church is dating back to the Crusader period. But there have definitely been some changes even since then. For example, the Edicule, the small house around the tomb of Jesus inside the Rotunda, was first renovated in the 16th century by the Franciscans. And then again, it was renovated in 1808 after the big fire that destroyed much of the Rotunda and the Edicule. The Holy Sepulchre Church is holy to Christians in general, but there are different denominations and they have fought, especially in the 16th and the 17th century, for the custody of the holy places. The big question was, who is in charge? Who can renovate? Who can use what part of the church? And when and who is responsible for the different parts of the churches? We're talking about the Greek Orthodox, the Roman Catholics, the Armenians, the Copts, the Ethiopians, the Assyrians. Uh, at some point in history, we also had the Georgians. So these were important questions. Who has the custody over these holy sites? And often these questions led to fights, and some of them were pretty severe fighting between the clergy. And it got so bad that the Ottoman Sultan issued a decree, a firman, in the year 1757 to stipulate exactly into details who was responsible for what and who had rights and how the space should be shared. And this firman of 1757 was later confirmed in 1853 and it is called the status quo. And the status quo is an understanding now between all religious communities about nine holy sites that are shared between these different communities. And it states exactly who is responsible for what, when they can have church services, which parts of the church can be visited by which group. And these firmans have even received international 
recognition in the Treaty of Paris in 1856 and in the Treaty of Berlin in 1878. And before we will start really with the guided tour inside in the interior of the church, which you can hear in the next episode, there is a striking example of the effect of this status quo on the outside, on the exterior of the church. If you are in front of the church and you look up above the main entrance, under the right window, you can see a small ladder. This ladder was first recorded to be there on a drawing that was made in the year 1728. So we know that in the year 1728, this ladder was already there. And maybe it was there even before that drawing was made. And basically it's been there ever since. This letter is mentioned in the Firman of 1757 that led to the status quo. And because everything was to be left as it was, not to be changed without the agreement of all the religious groups, the letter has never been removed. Well, not never, because there is a story that happened in 1997 where the ladder was supposedly pulled in through the window and hidden behind an altar by a Protestant Christian who wanted to make a point about the silliness of the argument over whose ledge it was that the ladder was standing on. So it was returned when they found it onto the ledge a couple of weeks later and now they have installed a great in the window. You can see it when you visit. It is now impossible to get even outside of that window anymore. In the year 2009, a few students of the tour guide program in that time were visiting the church and they were looking up and they saw the ladder had been moved to the left window and they took a few pictures of that and then not so much later, the ladder was back under the right window. So just for a short period of time, it seems to have been moved, but nobody knows why. There are different stories about how the ladder got there and what it did there, why it stayed there. What is sure is that the window and the ledge on which the ladder is standing are part of the Armenian convent. But how it exactly ended up there, this remains a mystery. During his pilgrimage to the Holy Land in 1964, the Pope, Pope Paul VI, described the letter as a visible symbol of Christian division, and I think that is very well said. Here it's also important to mention that all the strife between the different Christian groups has also led to a very old tradition, which probably dates back to the time of Slahadin, who already in his days, and that's in the 12th century, had problems with the different Christian denominations in the church. So he appointed a Muslim family to be the holders of the key of the church, and they open and close the church, and they keep the keys with them. And that is until today. The Jaude al Husseini family are the sole legitimate custodians of the keys and the Nuseiba family opens the doors with this key every day early in the morning and in the end of the day they are the ones opening and closing the door of the Holy Sepulchre Church. I should also add that the church is usually visited by pilgrims at the end of their walk through the old city of Jerusalem when they follow the Via Dolorosa and that is Latin for the way of the sorrow or the way of the pain, also translated as the way of the cross. And we spoke about this in the Easter episode of 2021. The route of the Via Dolorosa starts from the Lion's Gate and it supposedly traces the locations of important events that happened from the moment that Jesus was convicted to crucifixion and then when he walked through the city carrying his own cross, falling down several times 
until the Romans picked a man called Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross for him. And there are in total 14 stations where pilgrims stop. And then there is a small chapel that can be visited to commemorate those events. The first nine stops of the Via Dolorosa are outside. And then the last five stations are inside the church. And in the next episode, we will enter into the church. And then we will talk about those five stations of the cross and about a lot more that you can see in the church. But for that, you will have to wait until two weeks from now. Thank you for listening. Please consider supporting the podcast with a donation. It is free to listen, but there are costs involved in the production and quite a lot of time. It's very much appreciated if listeners chip in and you can already do that with a couple of bucks on the Kofi page. You can find the link in the show notes as well as other links to the social media accounts and the website. I hope you will tune in again for the next episode every other week a new one. If you enjoy listening to Stories from Palestine podcast, then I think you will also enjoy listening to my favorite podcast, which is called Jerusalem Unplugged. You can find it on most podcast players and on social media at Jerusalem Unplugged.